So. Yeah, <laughs> I was wondering. Well, are we all ready? Yeah, yeah. Shoot away. Fab. Richard, it's fantastic to have you here with us today to talk about your short films, Censure and Confines. Last time we spoke, you'd made Centurion and you were looking to get into making feature films. Now, Censure is third, just under 40 minutes. It's between a sort of short film and a feature. It's won numerous awards, which is amazing. Tell us how you made that jump from getting into short films from your animation background and the challenges that you faced. Fantastic, it was brilliant to be back here uh, talking to you again. Of course, last time we talked about my journey from animation to live action, and it's a gradual process. I learned from experience that baby steps are the key, baby steps. Now we had several uh, big feature projects uh, planned, and we still do, but the more money that's involved, the longer the process, raising finances, and all of the above. So I decided one day after a couple of projects fell through, I said to a friend of mine who's a great cinematographer, uh, John Fry, I said, for goodness sake, we've got the equipment, let's just go out and make one. And during lockdown, I had a lot of time to think and wanted to get out and, and film, but we couldn't. So I had an idea about a character on screen most of the time with all the voices off screen. I won't give away the story, but that was the core idea, but we could film it, uh, be economical and cheap. So it was all about the idea. So when we came out of lockdown and we didn't have those restrictions, I said to John, well, look, this is a great idea, let's do it. And I should add, by the way, this when I say a great idea, I work with a long-term collaborator, um, Neil Bassel, who's a writer based in Cornwall. And I'll throw ideas out and he constructs the story and has ideas, and it's his brilliant storytelling. Uh, um, and I'm lucky to tap into uh, such a creative like that. Well, all of them, really. But uh, Neil, uh, that's where it all starts, with, with, with the, the words on paper. So when it came to your first short film, Censure, yeah. uh, did you board that out completely? Interesting. How Interesting you should ask this, because for years I've done thousands and thousands of drawings on boards. And in animation, you have to do every detail, every, you know, literally thousands. In, in live action, you don't have to do it as many, but you have to do it in animation because it saves time during production. So it's, it's actually refreshing in, in live action that I don't have to do hundreds of boards. Now, because we were on a budget on Censure, the one after that I did do some thumbnailing, but on Censure, because it was all show, shot locally in the village and, and around, I knew all the shots, I knew what they were. I'd worked with John, so we had, uh, so I actually didn't need to thumbnail or, or storyboard because I could explain every shot. This is where we are wide, here's a tunnel, uh, this is what I'm looking at. Because John and I have that rapport now, he knows exactly what, where to pick it up on. The film after that, I did do some thumbnails, but we didn't need to refer to them on the, on the shoot because the thumbnails meant they were up here and I could articulate that to John, and somehow he instinctively knows exactly what I mean. I mean, Censure was our, our first full film together. We prepared a, a bigger film before, but it, wor it worked a treat. So, yeah, there's a definite chemistry uh, there between us. Yeah, I, th I think the, the blocking in the film was really good in Censure. You know, there's little moments where things are happening where it might, people, you might have cut away, but it's left on a wide. Yeah. And I think yeah. that made it really powerful. Did you, were you all, always thinking about the mise-en-scene, literally yeah. what's yeah. going on within the yeah. frame and letting the actors act? Because that's what it felt like. We discussed uh, all the shots uh, and there is, I'm not going to give too much away, but there is a dance sequence. There are two sections where there is a dance. And if, you, if, you, if you've seen stills from the film, you wouldn't, wouldn't believe it. But the first one is more energetic than the end, end scene where he does a more dramatic, slower dance. We kept it on the wide from a balcony could we could see the whole the whole area and I, again I won't give away why but we needed to see the whole area and it, it, it looks spectacular and that's why um, we'll talk more about um, locations the um, where we shot that film Ebenezer Chapel in in box which is an Airbnb by the way we could have tried shooting that in a normal house it just wouldn't have worked in a little house most houses but this one it's uh, it was a chapel it's been done up so we had it was, they were almost like sets. They, uh, fabulous. Each room was just superb to, to shoot in. There was another scene where... Is that where the bathtub was? 
Yes. Now, when I because that's I, an incredible. Like that, I, I looked at that and thought that's it's straight off a movie. It's straight it, off a movie well, set. It looked. I knew Adrian Chivers, by the way. Uh, Adrian is part of Noise in Your Eye with Daniel Penny, and we'll talk more about the, the music aspect, which is incredible. He owns this chapel and we looked at all the rooms and I saw this bathroom, an incredibly long bathroom with a, a Buddha and other items in there. It's just a superb setting. I said to John, we, we just need a slow track in and we're going to have a voice off screen whilst the stepsister is giving him hell for being in the bathroom too long. That literally We have a couple other cuts, but we, we stayed on that that wide for most of it because it was all about her barrage full on outside. I think that is one of the strongest elements in in censure is just the commitment to the shot and to the character yeah. because it just makes you feel slightly unsettled, unsettled. because yeah. you're not cutting away you're not yeah. given the freedom to look yeah. around and you're also getting inside the character because it's not what he sees it's what he hears yes. and sometimes that meaning can mean more mm. when you don't see the other person yes. because you just got the word. Just like when you read a text message and you're like, all caps, yeah. somebody's shouting. I think in a film, when you haven't got that cutaway, you've got that power. And yeah. that's something which I think is, is one of the greatest things. When you emote and you, you know yes. that you're making somebody feel something, yeah. it's like, that's, that's the magic. You know, it's all about, you know, Connor's character, Aaron. So all these voices this is what's going on in his head this it's all from his experience so um yeah it's almost like it's really it's really exaggerating what he's thinking it's really underlining his life and all the different annoyances and all the different obstacles that he's going through so for me it was absolutely brilliant fun because i could really just go for it and although i had felt i'd been given the lines to say Richard, you know, he did say to me, look, if you want to improvise, please do try things different ways. You know, we did multiple takes and then he was like, oh, why don't you just try saying this this way or maybe take that down a bit or make it a bit louder. So, um, I mean, I've still got the the track that I sent over to Richard and uh, it's, it's so funny to listen to because I just go for it and I'm just thinking, let's just be the, the nastiest, most horrible, manipulative we so-and-so that I can possibly be. It was great. I was just like, I'm just going to get in there. So it was lots of fun. And um, yeah, it, it was great being able to create a character with my voice. John makes all sorts of suggestions and great suggestions too. Because he actually did suggest that he turn around. And what I said, no, I don't want him turning. When she goes to the door, he's trying to block her out. He's trying to like keep her out of his head and she and he sits there and you can tell he's he starts to meditate and goes arm arm and his fingers are twitching Rest, restraint and knowing when not to do too much and playing it down sometimes is far more impactful so within the the production process of censure what gave you the biggest headache it wasn't a headache the biggest challenge was we're on him one character all the time before you make the film you watch it now and think well that works but when, before you make it, you don't know if it's going to work. You, you're just giving it a shot. So I was always aware, and obviously we had a fabulous crew all around. Angela Hughes would be doing many jobs, but she was off screen reading the dialogue for various characters. So when we're at the dinner table, we've got various characters that he's talking to and he has to refer to them. So she had to read the dialogue and indicate who's saying where, so we had to decide who was sitting where, big side note, uh, Tom Conti is one of the characters, so we've got his voice, which is absolutely incredible. And then the other challenge is, is with the, the voices, Tom's recording from London, uh, Vivian Taylor, who did the voice of the stepdaughter, fabulous actress, was up in Glasgow, as was Elaine uh, Ellis McKenzie, who's a, a well-known actress also. So they're all being recorded in different locations, and we have to make sure it all sounds like it's in one spot. People forget the sound is just a huge, huge thing in, in films to, to get right, because if it's not right, it, it, it ruins everything. Luckily, I, I hope we, we got it right. Because it's off screen, we're not having to match the performance to the characters on screen. So that's much easier, so. Censure's out and it, it, yes. you put it into festivals. T tell me about the, the process of getting a film out. The thing is with, with, with any film, uh, it doesn't matter how good it is if nobody knows about it. So it's hugely important. It, it's, it's, it's why back in the day when I worked at Disney on Hercules and Pocahontas, they would spend a hundred million on a budget. They would spend the same amount uh, on promotion. 
So, okay, so we're a micro budget. So you have to do it by stealth uh, and other means. But the great thing is you've got, you've got Twitter, you've got Facebook, you've got LinkedIn, all these ways of getting it out there. Now, one of the biggest challenges actually is that Censure ended up being uh, just under 40 minutes. And a lot of people said, you won't get it in any festivals at 40, you know, it's too long, but they won't, they won't show it. So that was a challenge. Now, we had two choices. We cut it down to 20 minutes or under 20 minutes, then it can qualify for festivals that qualify for the BAFTAs, or we leave it as is. Now, I looked at the footage that we, we had. The, the script was 20-something pages, and normally it's a minute per page. But because there's so much visual stuff and there's music and a dance sequence, all the stuff, it ended up being a lot longer, so just under double that. So we looked at it, and, I, and they're, they're sort of like, should we cut it down? I said, no, this is a story I want to tell. This is it. People would appreciate it for what it is. But if we cut this out, that doesn't make no sense of this part. So let's keep it. I said, next film we do, we spend our attention on the next film doing under 20 minutes. Yeah. This one, this is what it is. Yeah. So I stuck to my guns. We got it out there through Film Freeway to the various festivals, and it, it won over 40 awards. And we even got a trip to Cannes to uh, the Cannes Seventh Arts Art Awards, which was a fabulous experience. Myself, Adrian Chivers and Daniel Penne were able to go across, go to the gala and the, the ceremony. And when they suddenly mentioned our name, you, you could sort of think, really? <laughs> and we went up and uh, collected an award for uh, best score, I should add, by Noise In Your Eye. That's the other, another huge element, uh, especially of, of censure is the score because I had listened to an album by Noise In Your Eye many years before. Um, Adrian had passed me a CD, this is how long ago it was. I put it on and I was driving along. I thought, oh, this is good. So I pulled over, I listened to the whole damn thing. And I was like, wow, I, 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 I knew it was film music. Years later when I had this idea with Neil to do censure, I, I called Adrian, I said, uh, can, can we, talk about the music. Obviously to do a score from scratch is a huge amount of time, but they had a body of work, 10 years work, that he could adapt to this film, and it worked fantastically. He started putting elements of the music, and he's got all sorts, not only is it Adrian Chibbers and Daniel Penne, they have an ensemble of artists that they use, including um, Nick Mason from Pink Floyd is on the drums on some of the score. So he went through and selected what felt right and streamlined it and made it work for the film. Now, there's many elements in there that are, that are brilliant. There was one section we had of where Connor Wolfric, the, the main actor, which again we'll talk about him, he's stuffing himself with ice cream, more out of spite than enjoying it because he's told not to touch it. So he goes into the ice cream drawer, gets it out, and he stuffs his face um, with, with this, this ice cream. Uh, having to spit it out a few times in the sink, I should add, so, but we made it look as if he was eating all in one go. And I think he hasn't had ice cream since. We, we cut it into the film and we had the, the score was great. And I said to him, I said, let's, this is how interesting music is. I said, there's a section you've got in a song here with strings and they're very intense, almost Hitchcockian, if that's a word. That, can we use that and strip it down? So he just put a bit on, he said, he said you're right. That's going to work. So he went off, he stripped it down. So we'll see a bit now. He put this in and it works a treat. So music, sound, all these elements come into play on a film, all of them. Yeah, I, I have to say, I think some of the sequences of Aaron Connor Wolfric character, when he's walking through the woods and things like yeah. that, it, there's this uh, ebb and flow in the, in the audio, which it, it just really got me into the character. Yeah. So for me, I think it was there in the composition, it was there in the dialogue, but also letting the actor act yes. and just following the actor around, just for me, filled me full of questions. What was interesting is we... When I briefed um, Conor Wolfric, a brilliant actor, by the way, I'd seen an audition uh, by him for this film we were going to do in Ireland, still might do. I'm a director for hire on that project. So I'd seen the audition, and I'm like, ah, I want to use this guy in a, a film. I, uh, I want him to, to play a, a character throughout 
when he was rehearsing for the character, the, the, he's, he's got a speech impediment, the character, and we looked at all sorts of people. I talked to Connor, and what I would do is get him to send videos. So send a video, send a video of takes, and we discuss it. And we looked at Gareth Gates, uh, the singer. And what was interesting is he has a, had a really difficult stutter, and he would actually totally freeze on words. But as soon as he sang, it disappeared. So we've got something similar with this character throughout. These characters are in his head, he can't get rid of them. He's stuttering, he's uptight. And towards the end of the film, there's a sequence where he lets all of that go. And, and he, there's a speech to his father, and there's no stutter. And my God, is it powerful. I knew the basis of the story, and I knew it was very challenging in the discussions that me and Richard that we were having rather Richard would say like I really feel like we should go in this direction is that something you're comfortable with I'm like absolutely you know superficially no I don't want to do that but that was you know that was 10% of of my uh my petty ego I'll say and the rest of it was all like this is this is amazing what an absolute perfect storm of a situation so there was never this kind of like shock moment until I watched it back when they'd edited it all together and it was the first kind of rough cut. And even then from filming, you know, I, I'm slightly ashamed to admit that from filming scenes, I'd have, like to keep having to say to Richard, so what, where is this in the sequence before this happens? And, and he had it, to him, it's a straight road. He's got it all mapped out in his head perfectly. But to me, I was kind of like grasping all of that and put it together as we did it because it is so, there's just a lot going on. I felt the kind of fringe of it. Do you know what I mean? They're, they're kind of close to the limit, like pushing people's limits watching this. I was aware of that when we were shooting it, but I just think that that kind of filmmaking is, I love the challenge of that. I don't like, you know, one dimensional stories that are, that, are, that are too typical. I really like some depth behind the character. And even if it is a bit dark in places or challenging, then yeah, it's something, it's, it's something I don't really want to shy away from. I think they say something like, uh... In jazz, you never play the final note. Right, yeah, I love jazz. So, yeah, that's a it's... great example. Don't be too heavy with your exposition. There's some huge Hollywood films, and you, uh, you watch them go, stop it. Just imply it. They're trying, you can see what they're trying, they're trying to get information across to the audience through exposition, which you do kind of need to do. But the audience are pretty smart. So with Century, I've actually left a lot of things for the audience to work out. And there's a some possible different interpretations, and I'm fine with that, as long as it works for them. You know, for example, the voices in the head, in my world, they're all in his head and uh, he can't get them out, and it, we're just reflecting back on that. The audience may think it's happening in real time at times, which it's not, but it doesn't matter, it still works. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, different directors work in, in different ways. So we're, we're living here in the heart of Wiltshire. My goodness, uh, it, it's, it's no surprise that all these American film companies come over and shoot these big films, War Horse in Castlecombe, Harry Potter uh, at Laycock, and uh, Poldark in Corsham, just up the road. So why shouldn't we take advantage of it? We're right here. We can just go out the door with a camera and find a great location. So I live in a village called Box, which is a very historical uh, village. Uh, you've got Isambard Kingdom's uh, uh, tunnel, Box Tunnel, which is famous. There's all sorts of stuff going on. So I wanted a... a uh, to keep all the locations close, because we're on a budget, and the thing when you've got a big production, you have company moves. So you've got to get a load of buses and trucks, shift everybody, cost a fortune. So everything was in walking distance. So the main focus was the, the chapel, Ebenezer Chapel, had all the rooms that we could wish to shoot in. Then a handful of other places. There's a street just going down, or a road, going down the marketplace. And along there, you've got a butcher's. So we filmed the local, everybody chipped in, the local butcher is, is in there. We, we have all these people looking suspiciously at the beginning out of their windows. And we knocked on doors and asked people, can you, they were all up for it. The, the local uh, post office, Chris Cunningham, he, he has a few words in this film. So he, he did a fantastic job. You know, it, it, it's a community thing, so it's a great thing to do. So other locations, there's, uh, I live right by a park, and by that is a water park. So it's uh, maintained, it's got this magnificent old tree with a river. So we did a very a big key scene down there with Connor. And when we were filming down there, I think it was when we were scouting and looking around, John had a camera on him. And as we were walking down one of the paths, he pointed the camera up. He grabbed this shot. This wasn't my direction, he grabbed it. And I looked up, I thought, ah, I see what you're getting. And AD put the most incredible 
piece of music to it. It's just one shot, but it's it's so beautiful when you see it in the film. Just up from there is an old railway bridge underpass. It did rain quite heavily, so underneath the arches was uh, full of water, so you could see his reflection and the water drips, and John picked up all of those shots beautifully. So again, um, I've walked down there a million times and always thought, what a great shot that would be. There, So I was storyboarding in my head, if you like. There's another shot where he wants to get away from it all. He wants to get these voices out of his head, so he goes up, he gets a few beers at the, at the local shop and goes up to this war bunker, which is tucked away just behind Box Tunnel in some woods, so he goes in there. I had to direct from outside because there was only a small opening to get in. And of course the youngsters, the actor, and John could get in. And I wasn't gonna try, so I just directed from outside. So Richard, tell me about your cinematic influences and how they work their way in different places into Sensio. Well, as you know, I'm an ex-Disney animator, so I'm very visual anyway. So um, and with, with storyboards, you're, you're always thinking about the best way to tell the story. So you'll notice, yeah, in, in Sensia, we've got this shot in the, in the bathroom. And when you've got a beautiful shot, and when I think of cinematography, oh, my God, I think of Barry Lyndon and Kubrick and how exquisitely shot. It's like each shot's an oil painting. In, in Sensia, we've got the shot in the bathroom, and it just looks amazing. So let's let's... And we've got all this dialogue in the background, so let's stay on that shot. We've got candles going and all sorts of uh, atmosphere. When I made, did that shot, I, when I, even when I scouted the location, uh, I, I thought of Clockwork Orange and some of the shots in the house. And what's interesting is when we put the that scene online, several people commented, "My God, Kubrick!" Uh, you know, is wonderful. So all these influences do come out. So Kubrick's a, a, a big one, obviously. And Ridley Scott is huge. I mean, he came from a, a commercials background, highly successful. And he came to directing features very late in his career, people don't realise. But he had all that experience of the commercials and how to set up the shot. And, and then he translated that, like a lot of them did back then, in, into features. Top three Ridley Scott movies. Oh, top three. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to... Gladiator is is up there, not only visually, but the story and character. I know he gets criticised for story time, but I think he's great. Whacking Phoenix, the scene where he goes to hug his father. He's been seeking love from his dad, and you actually empathise with this nasty character. And he grabs him and he hugs him. He hugs him and he hugs him to death. He suffocates him. Wow, that's an impactful scene. So, so Gladiator for that scene. The visual stuff is exquisite, but it's all about the emotional uh, context of that scene. Alien was a huge impact because of my age at the time to go see a film like that but before CGI. They had to come up with all sorts of other ways of creating a scary monster that doesn't look like a man in a suit. So you do it with angles. And other and, and suspense, which is why it's a lot of the, another influence Hitchcock. Why his films are so amazing, they weren't able to do a lot of things, so they would imply things visually. So they would imply all these things instead of you know, instead of showing it. Right, up, right up, nowadays, you'll get a film, a vampire film, and you have all these effects up front, wham bam. It's like, well, where's the suspense? You want to be waiting for that. It's, it's like the Ray Harryhausen films, like Sinbad. I remember when I was younger you would wait for the monster to come in and you'd be there waiting. And then when video came in, my son uh, and technology, that was our technology video, we'd be sitting there, he'd go, the monster, the monster. So I had to fast forward to the monster, but it's better actually that you wait. Yeah. But all the youngsters now, even more so, they, they want it all up front, I want it now. But it's sometimes better to, to imply. So here's a key scene in Hitchcock, in, in Psycho, you've got, the, the scene where she's stabbed in, in the shower. Now, they weren't allowed back then because of the censors to show a graphic stabbing of someone nude on the screen back then. So what did he do? He used multiple cuts. I think Sulbass um, did the boards for all of that. I think they had 78 shots. So a lot of it is symbolic of the stabbing action shadows. Cut to the, the shower, the blood coming down. Um, all these different shots, and how much more powerful that is than just seeing somebody stabbed. It's more powerful. So restraint and implication restraint, again. Restraint and implication, 
Suspense. Yeah, um, Suspense. Third, third Ridley Scott movie. Oh, third Ridley Scott. Third Ridley Scott film, yeah, Blade Runner. Wow. Um, I need to watch that again. I've, I've only probably watched it about eight times. Have you seen the, the new Blade Runner? Sorry, side, yes. side note, Yes, I, yeah, I, I did. I enjoyed it. Um, I always react on an emotional level. I'm not like a film critic that will go in and say, it should do this, it should do that. I'm, I'm actually always very sympathetic to the director and try and see what he's about and his vision. So there are no real objections to me on that one. So we, we completed Censure and it did the, the, the festival circuit. A couple more to go. And I'm, I mean, I'm contacted all the time by different people and actors, so I'd love to work with you. And, but there was one in particular, uh, Luke Dejang, who contacted me. He was pretty successful early on in his career. He was in Holby City, uh, London's Burning, and uh, a lot of other projects, but took a time out um, from acting for a little while, but, and is coming back now. So he's looking for key projects. And we knocked around some ideas. I brought Neil Basson in, and we discussed some ideas. I told Neil about this blind house. It was just literally 100 feet from my house, which is where they would put somebody, if they drunk too much for the night, they would chuck troublemakers in there. I went in there once, and there's like a, a grill at the back with a light shining through. I thought, what a cool place to make a film. What if that was our core uh, place? Because I was thinking about uh, a man with uh, a mental breakdown, and he's beating himself up, and he's a prisoner of his own mind. And this would symbolise that. And we cut away to other things, other locations, and even some stock footage in places that, that works, and wanted to tell a story based in this, and so hence confines. Neil came back with a fabulous script, almost Shakespearean, uh, and ideal for Luke, because it's like a monologue. And it was 13 pages. We wanted to keep this one under 20 minutes. What I got Luke to do, again, is do some video takes at home, and he would, instead of just doing a sentence, he memorises the whole lot. He just does the whole lot. I'm like, how do you do that? I can't remember two lines, but he, but he can't. He's an actor. And I, you know. He sent me some takes. I thought, this is going to work. In fight or flight, I was Icarus, forever spiralling without control. And then, in a rare moment of glacier fresh clarity, I saw my escape blur. Wow. If you see that, it's in a sequence where he's in the maze and he, he's trapped in his head. And so this, this maze symbolises this entrapment and he can't get out. With confines, in fact, the censure as well, it deals with mental health issues. And they, the characters in both films deal with it in very different ways. But, uh, in confines, the blind house symbolises uh, entrapment. He's trapped in his own mind, so it's a visual way of showing that. And in a way, the whole monologue is a therapy where he's dealing with cognitive therapy and talking his way through. He's beating himself up. I won't tell you why, so I don't want to give away the story, but he's made a decision which affects his wife and he's beating himself up over that decision. So he's going around and around. And it's about the conclusion. At the end, all I'll say is that it shows that there is hope and we, we, we show that the, there's light at the end of the tunnel, literally. We go on that journey with him, and I think a lot of people can uh, empathise with the character because not one family is, is not affected in some way by mental health issues, whether it's depression or anything else. And as a creative, hell, I've been there, uh, you're rejected every day, wh whatever level you're at. How do people deal with that? So people have different coping mechanisms, you know. So I wanted to convey a lot of the ways I felt in life. And I know Neil Basson, I won't, yeah, I'll let him describe more as to how personal it is for him. It's really important. It's why I think a lot of the dialogue rings true because of Neil's experiences. There was a very innocuous incident that was like literally a seemingly nothing incident where I had um, an allergic reaction to some medication. Yeah. But I happened to have this when I was in a very crowded space. The following day, I was walking back and I got close to the place where this happened and I suddenly had this knot in my stomach yeah. and this fight or flight uh, kicked in. This panic attack started coming yeah. and those panic attacks lasted five years plus. Although it was a real like burden at the time and it was a burden for five years and there wasn't, at that point, there didn't really seem to be any obvious outlets and people to talk to to kind of overcome it so you're kind of on your own doing your thing for a writer 
it was like this first hand experience yeah, and insight yeah, yeah. into into what that feels like and what the panic attack feels like and the anxiety it was easy then to go in and to kind of unburden Luke's character with all these different things. Photography was by John Fry. Colour I wanted to use as much as possible, and I and I mean in terms of deliberate colour. I wanted to use colour as a bit of a character. So in the blind house, I was very blue because there's it's lit majoritively by moonlight. We have some fire crackling in the corner, and Jay has helped with this. Jay Cox, who who did the 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 final. Uh, edit and grade so the way it looks now is as much down to him as me the beautiful palette that he chose then for the outdoor shots particularly on the cliff edge at the end I think that all looks beautiful it's not the way I would have done it though I wanted to pull out all those beautiful natural colors and what he's done is push them back because that's what suits the story in terms of color I'm much more used to doing color correction so making things look as beautiful as they should be there and then whereas Jay gave the film much more of a look and another interesting side note is before the film you know on a big crew you have costume designers and all sorts of crew so we had to take care of all sorts of things ourselves so I had an idea in my head that he's a prisoner of his own mind that his clothing would reflect the, the mood. And now I didn't want a stripy prison suit, too corny. I didn't want a bright orange suit, too distracting. Um, and I'm a huge fan of uh, Steve McQueen in The Great Escape. So in that film, he's got like a kind of a light blue uh, sweatshirt, cut off arms, that's it, uh, and khaki trousers. And prisoner shoes tend to be uh, like canvas shoes with no laces. So he had canvas. So we made sure that was his outfit, except we had rough jeans, which is fine. Um, so he, so although the audience is thinking, oh, what's he wearing? It's, it, it gives a sense of that he's a prisoner. So when we cut to scenes outside where he's still trapped, when we go to the maze, he's still in his prison outfit. Uh, there's some other scenes where we cut back, where we see him with his parents, he's in normal clothes. So that was Im important. And when he's on the cliff, without giving too much away, he's, he's, he's in that outfit. When I had the idea of having the, this clothing, I didn't know it was going to snow. So poor, you know, we're sitting in this box in sub-zero temperatures and Luke is bloody freezing. We're all freezing, but I've got thermals on and a big coat. <laughs> so it was an intense atmosphere, you know. He, he was uncomfortable with it. Who wouldn't be? But what's interesting is that uncomfortableness led to an intense performance. You know, so it worked. It is. The, 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 you can see every eyelash... Yeah. is every pore on his skin, yeah. it's so close. It's close, and, and that's the interesting difference between 2D animation uh, and live action. Not so much with CGI, because with CGI now they have facial recognition, performance capture, and they can get those tiny details. With hand-drawn animation, you have to like exaggerate it a little bit more, um, so you have to caricature. So it's very hard to get those tiny things, which in live action, on a, on a face, filling the screen, you can pick up on all sorts of emotions. There's even lines where there's some spittle comes out of his mouth and he pierces his lips and it's like, whoa, it's intense. We were all confined and I get claustrophobic. I won't even get go in the window seat of a plane because I get too claustrophobic. But because my mind was on what we're doing and we've got everything in and we're in a tight space, what was interesting is that, um, I don't know if Luke gets claustrophobic, at one time John was doing stuff with the cameras and we were in his face, literally. He said, guys, can you just back off we need to do this stuff so it, it was interesting but uh bless him luke oh my god he, uh, what an actor for me the process with any role is once i've once i've read the role and read it a hundred times and and it's really in my head it's then a case of it's probably an instinctive thing from years of doing it i just connect with that character i just l try to get out of the way of myself and let that character talk through me. Everything is to serve the story, letting the words speak through you. Uh, and what comes out, comes out, you know, and sometimes it comes out and in one way, and then you do it again, it comes out in a completely different way. Um, but when you're not trying to force the performance or trying to affect it in a way, or I'm going to do it this way or say it that way, that's the fun bit of, of the acting where you, it's that unknown and this is something else I wanted to say in these indie films, is there's so many great actors out there, but all they need is the opportunity to show what they can do. 
And there's a lot of well-known actors you see again and again. And it's like, why do we need to see them again? I actually kind of like it when I see new actors because I, I believe them as a new character. I'm not thinking, oh, that's such and such playing something. No baggage. No baggage. The only difference between them is a break, a huge break. Same with Connor Wolfric. What a discovery. Same with Luke Dejang. What an actor. I, you know, I'm blessed to be able to find these marvellous actors to put them in my films. It's wonderful. Both the films have a strong lead actor and it's principally about them. Do you, how do you feel about, in future films, bringing together more, more of a cast? Ah, well, yeah, we're talking about budget. The, the only reason our films are, are more minimal is, is cost. So again, sometimes with limitations, you get creative. So in the first case, we put actors off screen that we didn't have to fly down, put up. And on confines, there was only one actress, uh, Vivian Taylor, who we did fly down from Glasgow to film. Now, the, the great thing about Vivian is I knew how good she was in her delivery on that bathroom scene. And I worked with her on several lines. And interestingly, that was the only sequence in the film that I physically wrote. So I actually wrote the dialogue for that scene. So I was able to go back and forth with her on it. So I knew in Confines there was a scene that I wanted to add in, in improv. Now, the script was fantastic. It's mainly monologue, but I wanted to get a, give a little bit of breath outside and some backstory. And I talked to both Luke and Vivian, and we set up in the, in the chapel, in the kitchen, and I gave them a brief about what the scene was was about and I explained it to them and then they went on nothing none of this was scripted so they went on and performed the scene and the first we did several takes after it which were good but the first take was like wow did they really just do that off the top of their head so uh, amazing so the great thing is acting is reacting so you could see when one actor said something the other one had to react to it spontaneously other than reading lines so a lot of stuff you see on tv it feels like they're reading lines. A lot of the series work, you know. Whereas this felt, you know, they may even cut each other off or talk over each other a bit. That's what we do in real life. It feels real. So I was delighted to get that scene. And some of my Disney experience actually helped because when I was there and at Warner Brothers, we would do improv acting classes. We would, we would have all, at Warner Brothers for six months in between films, being paid, given film classes, acting classes, whilst we were doing development work. It was like being at a university, you know, so all those experiences now I can take as a director and put into this. And I should say as a director in my more senior years, 20 years ago, a lot of these things I wouldn't have known how to have done it, but now I do. So I, I do think there's a lot of young, great directors. They have a certain approach, but I do think experience matters and can make a difference. And we need to support our older uh, directors in the industry. When we had uh, confines, the shoot days coming up, and it started to snow, I started to, to sweat it a bit, thinking, oh my God, we have to reschedule, we're on a tight budget, how are we going to do this? I was going to pick up our actress, uh, Vivian Taylor, from Bristol Airport, and there was snow everywhere, but as I drove down, I was worried about, you know, could the plane land, get her back, we only had the day and then I had to take it back the next day. Um, as I went back, went down to Bristol Airport, the, the snow was melting. I thought, well, if we're going to have bad weather, I want to show the snow. Now, when we drove back, amazingly, in Corsham, on Corsham Estate, on the grounds, the snow was everywhere, and you'll see this beautiful shot where they walk up a, a, a tree-lined path, and you'll, you'll see that it, it looks gorgeous. So we've got all these fabulous shots by the lake with the snow, birds on the ice, uh, where they're going, running up to a tree, it looks stunning. Um, another note about improv, by the way, is interesting. As an animator, I, I often like to create what's called business with an act when you're performing. When I was performing as an actor with a pencil, I would like to give characters stuff to do. So if you look at Rescues Down Under, Mujisa, she's, she's talking in the mirror. She's not even looking at the character behind, Penny. And she's, well, she's talking to her, she's do, pulling off her makeup amazingly animated. So I always keep in mind with the live action work, I like business, what I call business, character to, to, to do things. So I, I mentioned this to Luke and he was going down to the lake and they were going to walk up to the tree. He says, I'll give you a bit of business. So I didn't know what he was going to do. I said, go for it. So he went up, he went down. Suddenly he's giving 
Vivian a piggyback up to the tree. Yeah. And I thought, how delightful is that? We, and there's a laughter in the background. And John's going, oh, because he didn't expect that. And I, I love that kind of spontaneity, which is a lot easier in an indie film. Yeah. And you haven't got a whole crew there saying, we need to know exactly what you're doing and what spot and this. Like. We can ring it a bit, but you get a lot of freshness with, with that type of approach. And it adds something to the character and the sort of vitality of yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. the character's relationship. I learned a long time ago, um, Tom Conti uh, said to me, he said, Richard, give actors freedom, because obviously he likes to have that freedom. So if you give, my, my best experiences in animation were films where the directors would say, well, what do you think? Or what would you, so you give your opinion, and if they like it, you can do it. So uh, then you get the best out of actors. You know, uh, they're bringing something. They have some ownership of the character. Um, it's not a mechanical thing. Is there m times though when you say like you've you've actually written something and in your head you've got it one way, yeah. and you hear the actor's performance, you're like, man, that's that's just not the way I've heard it. Actually, funny enough, very rarely so far. I think maybe because we do a lot of stuff on video first for reference, I can see roughly what I'm getting. With with Luke, we we did the radio reference, and then after a while, I said, okay, that's enough because you can over rehearse. So there's enough there, he's done repetitions, he knows his words, but we still want a bit of freshness on the day. And, and if it goes a different direction, I, I will say, but so far, I'm very happy with what I've got. You know, it's bang on. Brilliant. So when, when are we likely to see Confines come out? Well, it's completed now, and it, it is now being entered into festivals. So it's already been selected at three, and as a nominee at the Cannes 7th, Art Awards, so we'll see if it wins anything there this time. It's also selected at the Accolade Global Film Competition, and it's also selected at Venice Shorts, California. So we'll see if, this, if it wins anything there. But it's entered into a bunch in the next six months, so fingers crossed. Awesome. Well, best of luck with it. You've got a, a multiple award-winning short. Yeah. You've got this other one coming out, yeah. so obviously... Yeah, we need to move forward. And basically... These are all baby steps. It's probably something I should have done earlier, thinking that I could jump straight into the bigger film. So it's all about momentum and building. The film that I would really love to make, it's called George and the Dragon, uh, and I'll tell you why. George was my grandfather's name. And the dragon refers to Yukio Tani. Now, I, mean, I know quite often people think of the Chinese dragon, but he's Japanese, and the Japanese dragons are, are pretty big. So that's the tie-in there. Now, technically, if you're... Um, Hardcore Cornish, you might say that's an English title. But it, it, it's a story that's set in Cornwall. It's not a historical, a factual thing. It is a drama. There's some, some factual things there. But that's the title I would, I would like to call it. I've delved into the research and talked to a lot of people in the uh, Cornish wrestling area in, in Cornwall. My grandfather had all sorts of stories when I, when I was a, a youngster that we, we would tell. And one of those stories, and I, I think it's true, was him and my grandmother were courting back in the day. They, they were, were courting. So they were in a field and there was a bull. I think it was a, a steer, so a young bull. It charged and he grabbed the bull, grabbed the horns and shoved them into the ground. Now, it could be a story, but he wasn't one to elaborate. He was not one to show off. If it was a steer... And he was a strong, strong man. I, I can believe this story. So in the story, I wanted to set off. Again, it's a symbolic idea about struggle. And I wanted to have the shot at the opening of the film, of a misty morning, and the bull charge, he grabs it, and he, he's struggling with it. You don't see him put it in the ground at this time. So then we go through and see his life and his struggles and his encounter with Yukio Tani and whatever happens there. And I want to end with the part where he finishes the struggles, grabs the horns, shoves them into the ground. And that symbolises that he's put that issue to bed and those struggles to bed so in a visual way. Yeah. Uh, Yuki Otani came over here from back then, what did they know in the, 20, the, the 20s, about Japan. Now, a lot of the martial arts around the world have similarities. They're all variations on the same thing. So Yuki Otani, as far as I know, came over. I'm not an historian but uh, kind of adapted and worked with the Cornish wrestlers and they had these uh, tournaments um, and my grandfather fought him twice and I won't say who won, but it's a fascinating story and I've got references from uh, newspapers and articles 
about all the history behind it. And it's absolutely fascinating. Now, it's an action film, you know, and historical and great drama. So we've got all these boxing films. There are a few good wrestling films. The Foxcatcher. It's a universal story. It's for everyone. The same with George and the Dragon. It'll work. I'll tell you this one little anecdote because uh, the, the film could be full of them. But when I was 18, my grandfather was still strong as an ox in his 70s, probably late 70s. And he said in his West Country, Burr, come here, bye, come here. So we wanted to say, yeah, grab, grab me. So they, they would have these jackets and they would, you'd have to grab the jacket and you've got the, the point is to get them onto their back. Now he grabbed me, I grabbed him, he said, throw me. And he's a lot shorter than me, but stocky. I couldn't throw him. Every, I, I tried and I tried. Suddenly, boom, I'm on my back and winded. And my mum shouts out the window, be careful with your granddad. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's getting it to the next stage um, we've got a fabulous script again by Neil Basson and we're ready to go brilliant well best of luck bringing your next project together be it George and the Dragon another short film you, you, you never know what will happen um, I mean, sometimes you get approached by people but normally you have to go out there and make it happen so we will make it happen mm -hmm.